Welcome back to the She Inspires podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jade, board certified family medicine physician, wellness and weight loss specialist, owner of the membership medical practice in Las Vegas, Inspire Primary Care. And I'm so excited for today's topic. I guess I shouldn't say I'm excited, but I am excited to be vulnerable with you all and share today's topic. And that is normalizing setbacks along the journey normalizing setbacks along the journey. And this came up because recently I was talking to somebody and they were just like, man, you're a doctor. Were other doctors in your family? Was it easy for you? You make it look so easy to do what you've done. And uh, and I realized maybe I haven't done a great job of sharing some of the setbacks I've had along my journey. And I've had so many, you guys. I've had so many setbacks so many issues along my journey, so many uh, struggles. And a lot of times we're seeing people in their ninth chapter, 10th chapter of life, and you haven't necessarily seen all the struggle seasons. And don't get me wrong, there are still pockets of challenging seasons in every season of life. But there were specific seasons that I'll share about today that were the struggle seasons of life, the ongoing continuous struggle seasons of life. And I want to be vulnerable and just normalize this, that setbacks are a normal part of the journey. I want to encourage someone listening that if you're in a struggle season, as I like to call it, to keep going, to stick with it. And I hope sharing three specific moments in my life that were my most challenging, my darkest times, that I hope by sharing these, that it will just inspire and encourage someone out there. And so just let you know that it is normal. It is normal. Don't let Instagram fool you, okay? So here we go. Number one setback that I want to share with you all is my journey of getting into medical school. So no, there are no one, there's no other members in my family, first degree or close relatives in my family that were physicians. I'm the first doctor in my family. So a lot of it was figuring out as I went as far as, okay, how do I do this MCAT thing they tell me I have to study for? How do I get in? I had no connections. You know, there was no one on the golf course making deals and getting me in. There was none of that, right? And so it was struggling struggling and trial and error my way through this journey. So I take the MCAT. The MCAT is a standardized test you have to take to get into medical school, to apply to medical school. This is near the end of your undergrad years. So I hear, okay, you need to take the MCAT. I took a course, like a prep course. Of course, I'm on track to get my biology degree. And I say to myself, okay, if I'm on track to get my biology degree, I've done all I can do struggling through undergrad, right? And now I've taken this prep course. I must be ready for the MCAT. That's the typical normal journey. I take this test, y'all. I think at the time it was like an eight-hour test. And... I thought I did okay, but I will say that through my journey, I definitely struggled with standardized test taking. I was like, I'm a hands-on type of learner. Like if I need to write it out, explain it to you, I'm good. But if I have to sit in a cold sterile room and read a question and say A, B, C, or D, my brain naturally is like, well, hmm, it could be B, but it could be D. Like that's just how I am. So me and standardized tests were not friends at baseline. But then when it came to tests like the MCAT, where it's eight hours of these type of standardized tests, it just didn't match with the way my brain normally and naturally likes to function. And I struggled, okay? And people would tell me, if you're a poor test taker, you need to pick another career because there's so many you have to pass to become a doctor. And I rebuked that. I was like, I'm, God told me I'm going to be a doctor, so it's going to happen. I'm going to just have to figure this whole test taking thing out. I take the MCAT, y'all. And when I tell you it was almost like I put my name on the test and submitted it blank, I bombed it. Like when I got the score and looked at it, I was just like, how? How is this possible to have a score this low? It was bad. It was bad. And I was, and they just straight up told me, my advisor at the time said, yeah, no school in the country will even look at you, let alone accept you with a score this low. So I knew I had to retake the MCAT, right? But I didn't want to do the same thing and get the same results. So I had to go to a program. Shout out to MedPrep. It was a two-year post-baccalaureate medical program that was basically like a two-year boot camp for students that were studying for that MCAT together. It was intense. We were up at the crack of dawn. We studied all day. We had all these different places we had to go to really drill in how to succeed at the MCAT. A two-year curveball that I did not expect. I had to do this program. The other curveball is 
Med Prep, I know, you know I love you, but it was in Carbondale, Illinois. That was like the cornfields of the middle of nowhere, Illinois. So I had to move to a place far away from my family in Las Vegas to conquer this dream that I had of being a doctor. And so it was a risk to go to this place I never heard of to take out a loan for this program. And I didn't know if I would for sure get into medical school and just really to trust God that he told me to be a doctor. So we're going to do what needs to be done. So I just share all this to say. I guess I can't leave this part out. So then I took the MCAT two years after doing that med prep program. Two years I retook the MCAT, although I didn't like blow it out the water compared to my first test score. I did blow it out the water, but I improved significantly. It was a test score that could get me into medical school and obviously eventually did. And I'll tell you how that looked on setback number two I'm about to share. But it was it was worth the risk. It was worth the two-year additional uh, quote unquote setback, but the additional two years that I wasn't expecting, the additional risk that I wasn't expecting, it all worked out eventually, although it did not look how I hoped or thought it would. Okay. So that was the first setback. But every time I have a setback, I always like to think of a pearl. Okay. Before I tell you the pearl to this one, let me tell you the last part. I guess I got to just go in. Y'all, these are like my most vulnerable, darkest times. So this is not easy to tell. I like to block this out if I could. So I had to really go back and ju judge this up these times. But um, but it's been enough years for me to be able to share it without crying. Okay. But so after med prep, I take the test. I told you I did good. Wasn't stellar. Wasn't horrible. It was solid. Solid. Okay. And so I applied at that time. Uh, most students applied to 20 medical schools. That was like the typical amount of medical schools you apply to. And usually if you apply to 20, usually you'll get into like 10 and you'll be able to pick the one you like the most. Okay. That's the typical course. Nothing about my course in life has been typical. Okay. So I applied to the 20 schools and y'all, I went to the mailbox 20 times. Let me just walk you through this. Winter of Illinois, these letters where they mail them to your house and you have to open them up and they either say you got accepted or you did not get accepted to the medical school. I went to the mailbox in the middle of nowhere, Carbondale, middle of nowhere, Illinois, in the snow, went to my mailbox and 19, 19 times, you guys, one nine, 19 rejection letters. I opened up rejection letter after rejection letter after rejection letter 19 times. So you can imagine the first one, two, three, four, five times I'm bawling each time. And you know, I my dream was to go to UCLA for medical school. So I get the rejection letter from UCLA. I'm bawling. Some of my closest friends were getting their acceptance letters to UCLA and other schools. So I'm happy for them, but I'm bawling and I have now taken the chance on this two-year program, invested the extra time, got a decent score, but I'm still getting rejection letter after rejection letter. 19. So fast forward to 19, envelope number 19. And at this point, I'm numb. I'm like, don't know. I guess, guess God is saying, I don't know what God is saying. Then I get to letter number 20, the last one, y'all. And it said accepted. Now, mind you, it was not the school that I wanted to go to the most. Shout out to SIU. I got into Southern Illinois University. That was my one out of 20 acceptance letters. But then this is how good God is. Not only did I get the acceptance from that one school, so... I'm like, okay, I wanted to go back west. I wanted to go to California for medical school, but clearly God is calling me to stay in Illinois longer. I'm about to accept this one acceptance because we're not doing this again a whole other year because the MCAT is only once a year. I would have had to study again a whole year to try to retake it again. And so not only did I say, okay, God, I guess you want me to stay at SIU a month later, I got a full ride scholarship to SIU. So not only did it work out, it worked out way beyond my dreams because to get a full ride scholarship to medical school is very, very rare. So I say all this to say the pearl of this example is it may take longer than you expect it to take. This may be along your schooling journey. This may be along your entrepreneurship journey. This may be around your career journey, your motherhood journey, your marriage journey, your house journey. Whatever that thing you're looking for for yourself, it may take longer. It may be harder but it is going to work out according to God's perfect timing and according to his perfect plan for your life. So I just want to be of encouragement to that and share that super duper struggle season. So that's number one, but I got two more for you. Okay. It doesn't end there. So setback number two that I had along my journey was 
Again, I told you I struggled with test taking, standardized test taking in undergrad. Well, that did not stop once I got into medical school. Again, it was all standardized test taking. And so I struggled those first two years of book work where you're in medical. The first two years of medical school is just book work. You read books, you sit in lectures, you take tests. The third and fourth year of medical school is when you actually start seeing patients and going on rotations and going from the clinic to the hospital. Those are what I call the fun years. But the first two years is just you, lectures, books, tests. That's it. So those first two years were so difficult for me because that's what it was, a cold classroom and a, and a sterile test, right? And so my second year of medical school, y'all, this is the hardest year of medical school. I failed a test that I had to pass to get to the third year of medical school, the fun years, we call it, when you actually start to do the rotations. I failed this test by 2%. I failed that test by 2%, which meant I had to repeat the whole second year of medical school. I was done, y'all. I was like, you can't bump this test 2% so I can go to year three. It was such a devastating moment. I wanted to quit. I said, I cannot do year two of medical school twice. That like, I was losing weight. I was, I had my whole apartment was covered in charts from the ceiling to the floor. I was a mad woman. Like the way I lived and studied and lived and breathed in every moment of my life was studying. And to do all of that, and still fail a test by 2% and be told I had to repeat the year was absolutely devastating, okay? And so, you know, I do it. I take the year two again, I pass, and of course, eventually I graduate medical school, right? And so I share this to share that being in Illinois, the pearl of this is because I had to have that extra year in Illinois, because I already told y'all, as soon as I graduated medical school, God willing, I was applying to residency all on the West Coast. And I was like, Lord, get me back West. OK, so I love you, Midwest, but it's not for me. OK, it's not for me to live there. So I was like, I got to get out of Illinois at this point. I would have had to be in Illinois for seven years, which I was there for seven years. That was not the plan. The plan was just to be there two years for med prep, okay? So two years turned into seven. And the pearl of that is because I was there longer, I met my husband my first time going through second year of medical school. I met him my first day of my second year of medical school, right? So extending that into another year, meaning I was there, you know, seven years total instead of the two years, it gave us more time to date. It gave us more time to get engaged. It gave him more time to get established in his career so that when I was ready to go off to residency, which God bless me with California, my first choice for residency, Loma Linda, shout out to Loma Linda. And so when that time came, not only was I able to go to California, which I dreamed of, but he was also so established in his career. At that time, we became married during medical school and he was so established in his career that they were like, we're keeping you. You can work from home wherever your wife gets matched. You're good. So not only were we in the position where now we're established, we're married, we're moving together to California. He's able to keep his career. And this was pre-pandemic. So working from home was not a thing yet. And for them to set him up where he can work remote and be wherever I was at, it was a blessing. The pearl to that is it works out. It's the same pearl, but it works out. If it's longer, if it's harder, it can still work out. So setback number three, y'all, I'm exhausted already because going through these is like, it's a lot, it's a lot. But here we go, setback number three. I'm a, if I'm gonna share it, I'm gonna share it. So now we're in residency, we're in California. Everyone tells me during residency, don't get pregnant because residency, not only, you know, I told you med school was hard, right? But residency is the clinical part on crack, if you will. Basically, they can work you up to 80 hours a week. I did, you heard that, right? They can work you up to 80 hours per week. Okay, and then I'm going from clinic to the hospital. I was on call, family med medicine residencies. We do deliver babies. So I have the pager. I'm on call when people are delivering in the hospital. We're on night shifts, day shifts. It's crazy. Inpatient, ICU, all of it. Okay, so you worked really hard. I get pregnant, of course, doing residency. My first year of residency, we have Ava. Then comes the pandemic. I'm pregnant. I'm doing CPR on patients. I'm letting, I'm hoping I don't get COVID. I'm working the ICU during the pandemic. It was just such a, a taxing time. So much so that because I was balancing 
you know, residency and babies and the pandemic and all of that. I struggled in some aspects. I did really well in residency clinically, like as far as my patient rapport and like the connection with patients, but still you got to take tests. It doesn't go away. So I did struggle academically some too. And so to the point where I had to get put on like a structured academic plan during residency. And I was just like, God, why at every single stage am I struggling academically if you've called me to be a physician? But what I've learned now is it's because I can share these stories with others and let them know if you don't look like the quote unquote standard student who just excels at all the science and all the math. And if your family is not a doctor, like then it's not in the cards for you. So I really share this to let you know that you don't have to look like what they say a doctor should look like academically, physically, any of that. If that's what you're called to do, whatever your career field, it can work out. Okay. So that's why I'm sharing this. So the pro to that is the same pro, y'all. It works out. It works out. It was harder. It was longer. It was struggle. There were times I wanted to quit. So when you look now at my journey and you're like, oh my God, the she has this or she has that, or you know, it looks like this, or this business looks like this, like it is not how it was the whole journey. There are still hard moments even now. And I just hope that this will encourage someone to keep going, to reach out for mentorship, to surround yourself by people who love you, that encourage you. I was so thankful that at every moment, my family was cheering me on and they were praying with me and to have church family. I get emotional just thinking about it because um, that is what matters because hard times are going to happen. So I hope this encourages you to keep going. All right. So now you see the graduated, board certified, you know, specialized in obesity medicine, inspired primary care owner. Yes. Mommy of two and adore my husband. All of that is amazing. But I thank God for bringing me through the journey and for my support system along the way. And again, I just hope this encourages you. So, uh, you know, I can't wait to just chat with you on the next episode. Please leave a review if you got anything out of this, if this encouraged you. Join us on our social media family. We're at Dr. Jade MD. That's where I'm sharing the behind the scenes on Instagram, okay? Join our YouTube family. Subscribe to the channel. Share this episode and this podcast with other busy professional women that are balancing business and wellness. And if you are a woman who has a product or service, that the women listening to this podcast would benefit from hearing about, reach out to our team to be a sponsor of the podcast. All right. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the She Inspires podcast.